This is the first part of the AP Physics 1 review booklet. A copy of this booklet can be downloaded at my website. Here we have a man of mass m holding onto a ladder connected to a hot air balloon of mass 10m, which is ascending at a speed of v. So right now our entire system has a speed upward of v. The man then begins to climb at a speed v relative to the hot air balloon. In the absence of external forces, there can be no acceleration for the entire system. And so the center of mass must continue to move up at the same speed. This is only possible if the new speed of the hot air balloon is less than v. In example two, two objects are held at a distance d in free space as shown in the diagram. They both have mass, so they must have a gravitational force attracting them towards each other. The magnitude of these two forces must be the same because of Newton's third law. For every force, there's an equal but opposite force. Now, if when released, they remain stationary, the electrical force must be in opposite direction to the gravitational force. This is only possible if the charges on these objects have the same sign. In example three, a boy holds a book against a wall by pushing perfectly horizontal with a force of F. Let's draw the other forces in. So the force of gravity is pulling down on the book. And friction is preventing it from sliding. And the wall's pushing back to the left. That's the normal force. Next, we should write the sum of the forces. Some of the forces in the x direction, we have the boy's push to the right minus the normal force to the left. And that must be equal to zero because the book is not accelerating. And so from this, I learned that the normal force is equal to the force that the boy is pushing with. Next, let's write the sum of the forces in the y direction. Upward, we have the force of friction and downward the force of gravity. And again, if the book is not going to move, everything must be equal to zero. The formula for force of friction, mu static times Fn. And the formula for force of gravity is mg, still equal to zero. So I can replace the normal force with the force that the boy is pushing with and bring mg to the other side. And I can see that the force the boy must push with is at least mg over mu s. Choice C. In example four, we're shown two situations. One in which a ball strikes a rod right at the center of mass, a second one where it hits the rod on the end. The correct answer to this question is choice C. The ball initially has an angular momentum in situation two relative to the center of mass. So here's the center of mass. If I draw a vector this way, that's my position vector. Here's the velocity vector. And the formula for the angular momentum of a particle is R M V sine theta. This angular momentum will get transferred to the rod and the rod will begin, begin to rotate. And we could actually calculate how fast it will rotate if we wanted using angular momentum equals I omega. Block one and block two are traveling in opposite directions when they collide at TC. We can see after they collide, they must stick together because they have the same velocity after they collide. We're supposed to select the two correct statements from down here. Uh, the momentum of block two is unchanged after the collision it seems tempting because we know that in collisions, there's the law of conservation of momentum, but that goes for the entire system. The total momentum of block one and two prior to the collision has to equal to the total momentum of block one and two after the collision. Instead, the correct choice is choice D. 
that the kinetic energy of block 2 is unchanged in this particular collision. Keep in mind that kinetic energy is a scalar, it doesn't have direction, and it's equal to 1 half mv squared. So if the velocity was 1 backwards prior to the collision, and it's 1 forward after the collision, then the kinetic energy would have stayed the same. The second choice we have to figure out is which block is more massive. Look at the change in velocity of block 1. It reduced its velocity by 3 meters per second, whereas block 2 changed its velocity by 2 meters per second. If the conservation of momentum is true, the amount of change in momentum of block 1 has to equal the amount that the momentum of block 2 changed just in the opposite direction. So if block 1 had a bigger, a bigger change in velocity, then it must have a smaller mass. And block 2, which had a smaller change in velocity, must have had a bigger mass. So we know that the mass of block 2 must be bigger. In, ex in example 6, we're given three wave equations, and we want to pick which two have the same frequency. So if we're looking at a wave, we can depict a wave as either a sine curve or a cosine curve, depending on where we start. Here I started as if it was a sine curve, but if I made my axis over here, it could be a cosine curve. So I'm not considering whether it's sine or cosine. Now the height of the wave is called the amplitude. And that's going to be shown with the numbers in front. So I really don't care about these numbers either. What I do care about, if this is a time axis, is the period. Because two waves that have the same period will also have the same frequency. The period is controlled by the factor in here before the t. That factor is actually called the angular frequency. And it's equal to 2 pi over the period, or 2 pi times the frequency. Since a and c have the same coefficient in front of the t, the 20 pi, they will have the same frequency. And so the answer is choice b.